All right, now that we've learned all that vocab, let's look at some examples um, and how we'll use the vocab. So we're not gonna memorize the vocab, but we're gonna know it well enough to use it in a sentence. So we're not memorizing definitions, but we're gonna use the vocab. Um, so let's look at some examples. Um, a study of Chabot transcripts revealed that students who take math classes during the evening tend to have significantly higher success rates than those who take them similar classes during the day. So is this observational or is this designed? Um, and the way we tell the difference is basically, are we controlling these students or did we kind of just look at data that already existed? Um, so it looks like we just looked at transcripts, right? Which already existed. So this is just observational. Right, we didn't control the students. No control. So the idea is that we looked at data that already existed and we didn't have any control. So it's observational. Um, so does this tell you as maybe someone who has trouble in math during the day that you should be well advised to switch to evening classes? Um, I would say probably not, right? We're not gonna just switch to the evening and we're magically doing better. Um, and so that's what a confounding variable is. There's other reasons. There are other reasons night students are doing better. And that is what we call a confounding variable. So it's not that they're taking evening classes and they're doing better. They're doing better because of these confounding variables. So some of those might be maturity. I would say more mature students take night classes or age, right? Those kind of go hand in hand. Um, working adults, so working work ethic, right? You ha might have a better work ethic if you're taking night classes because you're working all day. Um, and I'm sure there's more. So if you think of any others, let me know and maybe you can ask me if that counts. Um, so let's see our next example. Um, we're going to look at an allergy medicine. So I've been talking a lot about medications with these studies. Um, so a study conducted on an allergy medicine had 100 patients. So I'm going to go ahead and circle that. And they were split randomly into two groups. We like the word random in statistics. Um, one group received the allergy medicine and one received the placebo. So we've been using that word a lot lately, placebo. And then no participant was told what group they were in. And the study showed that by taking the medicine, um, they were significantly more likely to report drowsiness. So it sounds like the medicine might be making them tired than those taking the placebo. Um, so is this one observational or designed? So observational would be people are maybe taking the medicine by choice and we just ask them. Um, this one ends up being designed because we assigned the groups as the researcher, right? They were split randomly into two groups. They didn't make the decision. They were split into groups, or we could say probably the researcher had control. Control is an important word. Can we conclude that the allergy medicine is causing drowsiness? And this is where that cause and effect comes into play that we learned in the previous video. Because designed can show cause and effect, meaning cause, um, the allergy medicine is the cause and drowsiness is the effect. Um, and because it's designed, yes, we can show that the cause and effect. The allergy medicine is giving us an effect of drowsiness. So yes, designed experiments show cause and effect. What treatments were used? So treatment was a vocab word, if you want to look back at those notes. Um, but those are just the groups. So in this case, the groups would be the allergy medicine and the placebo. You can have more than two groups. You can have 10 groups. You can have lots of groups, but we only have two in this example. Response variable. So this is like the output 
from last video. Um, so there's the variable of allergy medicine and placebo, but that's not the output. The output was how tired are people. So the output is the drowsiness. So we asked people maybe, we measured how tired they were. Um, replication, this one's an easy word. Um, just is it being repeated? Yes, because there's a thousand patients. It was more than one patient, specifically a hundred. I said a thousand, sorry, a hundred patients. Um, and then is there blinding? Let me zoom out a little so we can go back to the top. Um, and the reason I know there's blinding is because it says no participant was told which group they were in. So we don't know if we're receiving the medicine or the placebo. So that is called single blind. Not told what group. Um, it could be double blind, but it doesn't tell us if the researchers know. No, we're not. So it's at least single blind. Um, and then data ethics was just kind of a th kind of three things really quickly from the definitions. Um, data ethics is consent. So basically that was informing of risks, getting consent in writing, and confidentiality. So this is really true for any study. So we should inform risks, written consent, and the last one was confidentiality. Great, I just have a couple more examples and the video will be over, I think. Um, so a researcher wants to investigate the effects of test texting and walking. Um, so they have 26 adults, healthy adults, as subjects, and they are monitored walking down a hallway, sometimes without a phone, um, sometimes while texting, writing a text, composing a text, and then other times while reading a text. So those kind of sound like my groups right there. Um, and researchers noticed that texting activity significantly distorted the subject's walking form. Um, and so treatments, again, are the groups. Um, so what treatments were used? So we had one group with no phone. And then we had texting, but we really had two different texting groups. So we had composing a text versus reading a text. Because those might take different amounts of effort. Replication. Yeah, it involved replication because there were 26 subjects. As soon as we do it to more than one subject, it's a replication. Um, the primary response variable, so just the response variable. Um, what were we measuring? We were measuring how people were walking. Um, so it looks like I called that walking form. And the last one is blinding. Um, it doesn't really tell us about blinding, um, but I think we can kind of figure this out. So would you know what group you're in? Yeah, you would know if you have a phone or not. So there's no way to have blinding here. Oops. As a participant, right, you would know if you're texting or not. So these are the types of questions I'll probably ask you rather than like state definitions, just look at studies and use the vocab. All right, so last thing we'll cover is cause and effect. Uh, just go in a little bit more detail about that cause and effect. Um, in general, we shouldn't make cause and effect statements from observational, right? We talked about that when I first defined observational studies. Um, and that's because there's so many confounding variables. You don't have control over the subjects. So there could be other reasons. Uh, but in reality, this happens all the time. Um, it doesn't mean they're drawing wrong conclusions. Um, there's just some things we need to be cautious about. So here's an example where we really don't have a choice. Um, 
So in an observational study, researchers identified a group of 469 people with brain cancer. They paired them each with a person. Um, they paired each person who had brain cancer with someone very similar. So sim same sex, similar age, same race, who did not have brain cancer. And then they compared their cell phone use. Um, and so we really had to do observational. Why could we not do designed here? Multiple reasons. Risks. If someone told you the risk was brain cancer, you're not signing up for this study. Um, another thing is it would be really hard, um, almost impossible to con control cell phone use. Right, That's a factor we can't really control. At least long term. Maybe in the previous example, when we're just walking down a hallway, right, we can control it for that, but we can't control it for long term. Um, and so that's why they do this matching. The matching attempts to kind of take care of confounding variables um, and other reasons why they might be getting brain cancer, um, but it's not perfect. So even with all these adjustments, it does provide stronger evidence, so we can be a little bit more confident of that cause and effect. Um, cause and effect, again, is saying cell phones cause brain cancer. That's what cause and effect means. But we should still be really cautious when we read studies like this. Um, so you see observational studies all the time. Um, and so anytime you read one, you should still be cautious um, and consider any possible confounding variables. So as a reader, you're responsible to kind of think of confounding variables on your own, whether they state them or not. And that's what's going to make you a responsible adult, reading statistics and not taking things for granted. Um, a lot of us maybe just accept all the statistics we see online, and sometimes we should question them. So it's really important to always think about possible confounding variables. Cool. So um, contact me if you have questions. Hope this video went okay.